Okay, so a very good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, my name is Paul. Um, I'll be your tour guide for this virtual tour. It's a, a two-part uh, piece. Uh, it's full titles from rags to riches. So tonight we'll be looking at from rags, which is the area of Soho. And then next week or the next video after this will be uh, on Mayfair. Then that's the, the riches part. Uh, so I'm just going to deal with uh, wonderful technology here and share the old screen just so we can get that up. There we go. And we'll just uh, launch this from the beginning then. Okay, so uh, from rags to riches. From rags, this week's tour is going to be looking at the area of Soho. Now, if you've been watching my uh, previous videos, you'll notice that tonight I'll be doing uh, things a little bit differently just with the, the layout and the sort of styling of it, because I realize that a lot of people are watching these videos on their tablets or mobile devices. So uh, the idea is to try to make the images a bit bigger. So you'll, you'll see what I mean um, when we go through it. So once again, we'll look at the area of Soho, uh, starting at the beginning with this development. Uh, we'll look at some of the famous people who used to call Soho home. And uh, then we'll have a, a little bit throughout it uh, about the music, the music scene, because uh, that is heavily embedded in the wonderful area of Soho. Uh, so, of course, as usual, focusing on London. Now, the last four weeks prior to this video, uh, I've been looking at different areas. So the first week uh, we looked here at the area of Pimlico. Then we moved up to Fleet Street and then we made our way back westward towards St. James's and Powell Mall and the Mall. And then uh, the last video was on architecture around the city of London. Uh, so this week we're going to concentrate then on the area of Soho. Uh, so we'll just zoom in here. It's this little area of Soho. Basically, if you can see my cursor moving along the top of the screen, this is Oxford Street. So this is the new boundary of modern day Soho. And then if you head south from Oxford Street along this road with the cursor, with this J turn at the end, uh, that is Regent Street leading into Piccadilly Circus. And then this street takes you up to Shaftesbury Avenue. And then at the end here, you would turn left and head up Charing Cross Road, uh, back to Oxford Street and the Tottenham Court Road. So this is the area that we're going to be focusing on uh, this evening. So it's all in the name. If you've been watching my previous videos, you'll know I get a kick out of um, etymology, like the origin of names or certain phrases in English history and British history. Uh, Soho is no different. Now, this image is not of Soho, London, but of Soho, New York City, good old NYC. The reason I bring this up is because people think it's named after the Soho in London. Um, you, you'll find that uh, throughout America uh, because the old British colonies, you'll, you'll get some familiar uh, place names that were taken on from England, like Boston and New York and so on. Soho is completely different uh, because if you know Manhattan Island quite well, the area of Soho is south of Houston Street. Okay, so that's where they get their south s o of and houston h o for soho uh, it's not that way here in london if we take a little look at this old map of london this is depicting london in the 16th century so imagine henry the eighth is on the throne the beginning of the tudor dynasty are he carrying it on from his father and we've got the River Thames here. We've got London Bridge crossing over it. The City of London, the heavily developed area, the Tower of London to the right. And then Fleet Street and the Strand over to the west here to the left side. Now this band, you'll get very familiar with this band uh, as we go through our tours because it's a great indicator to know that you're heading down towards Westminster, which is this area to the left, Old Thorny Island with Westminster Abbey and the Houses of Parliament and the old River Tyburn, uh, creating the island flowing into the Thames. And then if you were to head away from here, you'd head up Whitehall and into what is now Trafalgar Square. But in Henry VIII's day, it was, um, you passed the Palace of Whitehall, which you took over from Cardinal Wolsey, and then into the Royal Mews, which the Royal Stables, which is now where Trafalgar Square lies. Uh, a few weeks ago, then we looked at Pall Mall. So this is Pall Mall here, We're running alongside St. James's Park. And this is the area of St. James's we looked at, still underdeveloped with Piccadilly. And uh, this would be Piccadilly Circus here. And as we zoom in a little bit more, the area we're concentrating on, you can just see is full of fields. 
Okay, that's what it was. It was actually forests. Okay, it was wild woodlands, and it was hunting grounds uh, for Henry the Eighth. And this is where the name Soho originates, because one of his lords, uh, you know, as they went hunting, which is depicted here, these are more Victorian style hunters rather than the old 16th century Tudor hunters, with their top hats and their rifles and sort of bugles and all that. Carry on. Hunters across the land, the landed gentry uh, for the sport, would often train their dogs, typically beagles, uh, other breeds were used as well, to react to a phrase. Now, throughout most of Britain, the phrase was this tally ho okay tally ho and off they go well lord monmouth around the area of soho trained his dog to react to a phrase word and you guessed it already yeah it was soho that was the word he used so that's uh, the name sort of stuck the the local area uh, until it started to be first developed in the 1680s then so about 150 years after uh the death of henry the eighth so this is Google Maps, sure many of you recognize it. Uh, so I've highlighted a couple of areas here. We've got uh, the blue posts, okay? You see that one in the center and over to the west of it, you have another blue posts. And then on the south side, you have the blue posts here as well. The reason they were called the blue post was because they marked out the old royal hunting grounds, okay? So as a peasant like me, if I was back in the 16th century and I walked past a big wooden stake that had been purposely painted blue, I would know that I'm entering royal hunting ground. Now, if I went ahead and poached any animal, so if I hunted myself without the king's permission, uh, and I am seen walking past this blue post, heading back towards uh, the city of London, for example, with a deer or a wild boar over my shoulder, and guards caught me or soldiers caught me, uh, they could take off my hands, I could lose a hand, or they could even take off my head. Uh, so yeah, uh, that was the penalty of it. So not great. But these are pubs and hotels. Uh, there's a few more of them around Soho as well. Uh, temporarily closed because of the whole COVID situation. Uh, we'll have a little look at this one. You just see it popping up on the, the bottom of the screen here. Uh, so we have a look. There we go. Blue post. So they are quite common in Soho, and now you know why they're called that. Um, it's a nice little bar. It's not the biggest pub in the world, but yeah, it's there. Uh, we're going to walk down this little alleyway here, okay? So we've walked down the alleyway and we've turned back looking at the pub. This is for the bit of music, okay? I'm not going to go into an entire rock and roll uh, tour because my regular walking tour uh, for rock and roll takes about an hour and a half, and we've only got 30 minutes, so... Uh, I'm going to drop in little pieces here and there. The reason why I chose this one is because it's often overlooked. But if you're a Beatles fan, you should recognize this alleyway. Or maybe not. It was actually used as their very first promotional photograph when the boys returned from Germany then. Uh, to show you uh, what I'm talking about is, we'll just put the Beatles up. There we go. See? See a archway out in the back. Now you got the four lads walking towards you, and they're actually walking uh, towards us in towards Chinatown, which was there uh, in the 1560s. Chinatown moved to this area after the end of the Second World War, coming over from East London, where they were first located in uh, Limehouse. Uh, so there's the good old Beatles. Now, Soho Square. This is where the residential area of Soho began. Uh, the developer here, um, started developing in about 1680. Uh, within 10 years, he had built around 41 properties around this square itself. And this was uh, after Covent Garden and the area of St. James's had been developed west of London. So originally, Soho Square and Soho was for the riches, okay, the wealthy. Um, because there's only wealthy people who were living in uh, areas like this, not the, the poor working class people of the uh, city of London or the East End. But we'll explain why it changed later on as well. So Soho Square, uh, we've got the square in the centre. We'll have a little look at the building up at the top, and then we'll check out this little office over to the left office. So this is just to orientate yourself, okay? Uh, so north, east, south, west. And we'll check it out. So if you haven't seen any of my videos before, I talk about the gardens um, quite a few times. 
Basically, because of the lack of space whenever developers were building these new houses, uh, they decided to go against the idea of everybody having their own private garden and would have one centrally located communal space um, that were often referred to as key gardens, being private only for the people and residents of the square. And this may have started off as this, or it may have just been a, a completely uh, communal public garden to begin with. Uh, but yeah, this is Seoul Square. You've got the little um, caretaker's house in the, the centre there. You've got uh, the church at the back, uh, St. Patrick's, I think it is, the Roman Catholic Church. You've got a private club off to the right, which is St. Barnabas, not in this photograph, it's in the right-hand corner. Uh, 20th Century Fox is in the other corner behind us. But we're just going to go off to the left, okay? We're going to go to the north side of the square to look at uh, this old house, okay? This one in the centre. This is where a very famous lady lived. Now, this lady has a link to a previous tour when I was talking about Pall Mall. Um, the lady volunteered for the British Army as a nurse. The British Army refused her uh, simply because of the colour of her skin. And she had travelled all the way over from the West Indies. So her counterpart that I talked about was Florence Nightingale, the very famous Italian nurse. This lady sort of fell by the wayside uh, as regards to uh, the historians, but thankfully many historians have looked into her stories and uh, have made a lot more information known about her. So her name, Mary Seacole, and there it is, the blue plaque above the doorway. And uh, she didn't live here for all those years, that's just her lifespan. She was just um, born in 1805 and passed away here in 1881. And as I mentioned, she was a black lady from the West Indies, travelled over to volunteer her services. Uh, the British Army said no. So she thought, you know, saw that. Her and her husband uh, went further and traveled over to Crimea then. In the midst of the battle, they set up the very first uh, hospital, uh, proper hospital, which was known as uh, the British Hotel. And uh, yeah, she went to work just like Florence Nightingale, not being paid for it, just doing it from the goodness of her heart. Uh, so thankfully, historians have recognized her over the last number of years. And there's a wonderful statue, this one, um, which is located outside of St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, behind the statue, actually, on the other side of the building is the Florence Nightingale Museum, which does now, thankfully, reference Mary as well. Has done for a number of years. That's Mary. Now, we just jump over uh, to the west side of the park. Now, this office building here. This office building has a link uh, to something I've already mentioned earlier on. I wonder if you can guess what it is. I'll give you the name of the office and the company. Well, I'll give you their initials. Here they are. MPL. MPL. Now, who was I talking about earlier on that would own a company called MPL? Yeah, it's Sir Paul McCartney. Okay, from the Beatles. Uh, this is McCartney Production Limited. So this is his office. I just go back one image uh, to the office space. This is, uh, so the ground floor, the doorway here, and then this first floor window is Paul's, Sir Paul's office. And it's obviously not about here uh, because of COVID and everything else surrounding it. Um, but if you come back to London after lockdown and the blinds are uh, pulled up open here, then you, you often see uh, Sir Paul walking about then. So that, that's his uh, London office. So remember those initials, MPL, especially if you're a Beatles fan. Okay, so we're going to take a little walk now. So we're at Paul McCartney's office here in the west side of the park. So we go around the corner, the wonderful Tukin. <laughs> Uh, someone at my uh, live uh, broadcast of this tour asked me if uh, that's the best place to get a pint of Guinness, the token bird, uh, you know, the one with the big uh, orange beak, uh, off the link with the uh, Guinness branding. And they do it a nice Guinness in there, I have to say. Um, the red dot here is what we're going to look at. So at the end of Carlisle Street, you have a dead end. This is the back of a hotel and this little office building. So... Sorry about the quality of the photograph. It's rather dull here, even though the sun's out. It's just uh, a little alleyway. But if you can make out here where my cursor is, private eye. Okay, so if you're from the United Kingdom, you might have heard of this. It's a very popular uh, current affairs magazine. It's posted or it's printed, published, 
whatever the right word is, uh, fortnightly, every couple of weeks. Uh, they have an annual subscription of about 245,000 people um, uh, get it every uh, couple of weeks. And others can buy it on, you know, when it's out at uh, newspaper stands and so on, especially in London. Uh, this year celebrates its 60th anniversary. Okay, so it was set up in 81 and then it was taken up, no, set up in 61. Uh, in the 1980s, it was edited and still is today by this gentleman called Ian Hislop. Okay, I think from about 1986, he took it over. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a very popular magazine. Um, they're, they're sort of famous for their in-depth undercover, you know, investigations and sort of shining lights on stories that the big media moguls are anyone who's wealthy and can sort of try to get away with it. These guys try to make sure they don't. If you're not familiar with Ian Hislop, uh, if you're not from uh, the UK, you haven't lived here uh, for a while, a very popular uh, political show called uh, Have I Got News For You. Uh, you can look it up on BBC iPlayer. And uh, he co-hosts it with his uh, good friend, Paul Merton. So yeah, they've been doing that for the last 30 years as well. Okay, oh, actually a great story. That's where we'll head to next, uh, about Ian Hislop. Uh, so Private Eye editor. So that's the Private Eye magazine, the red dot up to the left. Now, if we just walk through Soho and head down Greek Street, bottom of Greek Street and Old Compton uh, Road, or Old Compton Street, is uh, this pub. It's called The Coach and Horses. The Coach and Horses uh, is basically a wonderful pub. Love this pub, especially on a Saturday night. Uh, they always get a, a professional pianist in, and they normally play like old World War II songs and sing-alongs and all that type of stuff. Really good fun. But... You might hear some of the locals not call this the coach and horses. They'll call, normally call it Norms or Normans. And that's after the old landlord who um, is retired, I believe he's passed away now, Norman Ballam. He was known as the grumpiest landlord in the world. And basically, Ian Hislop, you see the windows just above here? So that's their dining area. And Ian Hislop used to hold meetings here and interviews and so on. And he was up there one day with a very famous lady, a lady by the name of Margaret Thatcher, who became the first female prime minister of the United Kingdom back in the uh, late 20th century and uh, the 1980s. And basically, Ian Hislop uh, was having an interview with Margaret Thatcher and Norman came up with their lunch order, which is just a light bite. It's uh, sausage rolls, quite a favourite here in the UK. And uh, Margaret Thatcher decided to complain about the quality of the sausage rolls. So she sent them back to Norman, and Norman barred Margaret Thatcher for life. There you go. A uh, claim to fame. But I have to say, a fantastic pub. When we get back to our pubs, this is a great place to, to go meet your friends. Right, so from the pub, the red dot that's on your screen on the right-hand side, we'll walk all the way over to Berwick Street here on the left-hand side. Barrett Street, uh, go drop in another little musical one from the 90s. I wonder if anyone recognizes uh, this street from a particular album cover. Now, it's not the Beatles, who are from Liverpool, but from one of their neighbors uh, down in Manchester. Uh, so this street was used as the cover of an album by a band called Oasis, okay, the Gallagher Brothers. And basically, uh, the album cover was called What's a Story Morning Glory. So have a look here, especially this tenement block here. OK, some of the street lights have moved and the, the road's been leveled out here. You'll see more of a curb. Just take a look at that there. See There's the tenement block, the light fixture sort of gone and they've it's sort of evened out the, uh, the whole road here. But it, there you go, that's the album cover. Um, it was one of the members of the band, not the Gallagher Brothers, but another member. Uh, forgotten who, uh, but his mother used to work on Barrack Street in the uh, fruit and veg stands, okay, uh, like this, oh, yep, there you go, and uh, for that reason, the Beatles decided to use this, or the Beatles, Oasis decided to use Barrack Street, um, not only that, but like Soho's full of musical history, you know, talk about the Beatles, the Rolling Stones were formed around the corner with Brian uh, Jones, and uh, yeah, uh, 
Oh, there's so much musical history. I'm not going to get bogged down in that because we'll be here all night. Uh, so yeah, and you might have got a sneak preview of something I'm going to talk about in a second. And that was uh, the very first tomato uh, that was ever sold in the UK. It is said, it is believed, uh, was sold here on Barrack Street. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Random bit of knowledge for you. Why not? Okay, so from Barrack Street, we're going to go to have a look at the, the rags part that I was sort of emphasizing on. So at the beginning, 1680s, uh, all the wealthy landed gentry moved from the city of London westwards to areas like Covent Garden, the Strand, then Soho, St. James's, etc. By the Victorian periods, in fact, just before that, in the early 1800s, Soho was not the best place to live in because essentially the Mayfair, which will be taking place and the next video, the next tour, that had been developed by the Groveners and aristocracy had moved westward once more. But they still wanted their tradespeople, you know, the working classes, the guys and girls that did all their job for them to live nearby. Uh, so they did, they flocked here from the early 1800s and it got really overcrowded. It was known as the meaner houses, so overpacked houses full of multiple families. Obviously, no outhouses um, or, you know, private outhouses anyway, communal, if you had any. Certainly no indoor plumbing, none of that type of stuff. Uh, but yeah, it was pretty grim at this stage. And in the Victorian period, uh, cholera. Cholera was a big, massive problem. Like the River Thames had been used as an open sewer since the time of the Romans. So you're talking about AD, what, 55, 60? Uh, up until the Victorian periods, 1800 years later. So you can imagine the state of the river, the smell, the bacteria that was uh, going about. And that actually takes us to our next little stop. So we were on Barrack Street and then we're just gonna walk straight down Broadwick Street here, just to the corner. And we'll come up to this pub. Nothing to do with Game of Thrones <laughs> before anybody gets excited. Okay, not that Jon Snow from up north. Uh, this is a very different Jon Snow. Okay, so to show you who I'm talking about, gentleman on the left, Dr. Jon Snow. Dr. Jon Snow is considered to be the father of epidemiology. Okay, um, so the study of epidemics and viruses and their spreads. He used statistics to understand, analyze, and come up with theories, and especially cholera, because before Dr. John Snow here, the government and all medical advice was that cholera was an airborne bacteria. Okay, that's how it was transmitted through the dirty air. And uh, he really discovered that it was actually to do with the water. The cholera was a waterborne bacteria. So he goes down to the House Department with his findings into the House of Commons and makes this declaration. Cholera is to do with the bad water. We have to sort that problem out before we can get a handle on this epidemic. And the government just said, no, no, it's not. It's, it's airborne. We know it's airborne. We've got proof it's airborne. And Jon Snow was outraged. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. He got no help. So he goes back up to uh, Soho area and destroys the water pumps, okay? People think he's mad. He just takes a hammer, a sledgehammer, and starts going uh, crazy on the, uh, the water pumps in the local area. So everybody uh, turned to the pubs then. Uh, not uncommon, by the way. Uh, the beer that they would sell would often be watered down, very weak uh, alcoholic content. But because it had gone through the brewing process, it killed off the bacteria uh, that would spawn cholera. So after he destroyed the pumps, about 12 or so in total, um, El Soho began to go upwards in their house. People weren't getting sick of cholera anymore starting to fade, not the rest of London, but in Soho. So that gave him the definitive proof to go back to the House Department and go, look, I've got it, it's here, we're done. And so that's what happened. Uh, around the same time then, because this was uh, known as the Great Stink in 1858, and uh, the government had hired an engineer called Joseph Bazalgette to build the first sewage treatment plant in London, uh, one of the big underground uh, wonders of London, runs from the House of Parliament, sort of embankment station, uh, down alongside the river. And this is to treat the water in the River Thames for the very first time. Because it'd only be a hundred years after this, 
that uh, his treatment plan can only do so much. But 100 years after this, that the uh, River Thames was declared biologically dead by scientists in the 1950s. And they put up this wonderful replica. Um, obviously, I said he destroyed the pump, so this is not the uh, actual pump. But if you ever see this outside the John Snow, now you know why it's there. There's a little plaque uh, just below it you can see there. And it's just telling you uh, what I've explained. So from John Snow then, we'll have a look at this map. So this is wealth distribution. This map, beautifully uh, put together map, was designed by a gentleman called Charles Booth in 1889. So we're still in the Victorian period. And he was using census information to uh, plot and define a wealth distribution within London, the greater London area. So he mapped out the whole area. So remember at the beginning, I was talking about Soho and I got you to sort of focus on that J turn at the end of Regent Street here. So this is Oxford Street and this area is Soho. So mostly all red. And then this is Mayfair, but this is the real Mayfair over here in the Victorian period. So all green. You know, all the wealthy people living here right next to the park. And actually in the early 1800s, uh, 1803 to 1833, Regent Street and the area around it was being laid out by um, John Nash, who was the architect behind um, the development of Buckingham Palace and St. James Park. He was hired by Georgie Porgy. Remember Georgie Porgy putting in pie, kissed the girls and made them cry? That's George IV. Uh, so he laid it out with the intention to separate, to have this barrier of the wealthy on the west side and the poor people on the east side. Now, someone asked me uh, again during the live broadcast that why did, um, if this area was crown estate, it was owned by a royal family and then leased out to the developers and it was for the landed gentry in the 1860s, why then, um, did it go so bad so quickly? You know, you're talking a, a period of about 140, 50 years then. And it was simply because of what we'll look at next week, Mayfair. So the Groveners had developed Mayfair. So the wealthy just hop, skip and jump over closer to the big Hyde Park, fresher air over here, all the trees. And they still wanted their workforce close by. And people were happy to live in slum like conditions to get out of the uh, city of London and the East End because in London, the prevailing wind blows from west to east. So all the bad smells always go east. So all the factories and all the tanneries. And remember, Victorian times during the height of the Industrial Revolution. So it was all going eastward. So if you were given the opportunity uh, to get move to Soho, you would normally take it. So that's why. That's why the wealth distribution changed so dramatically in this area in that length of time. All right. So... We're going to look at so we're up there on Broadwick Street. We'll stay on Broadwick Street, but we're heading down to the corner here, Carnaby Street, very famous. We'll get on to that in a moment. And this is from the title page. There we go. Uh, we're looking at the spirit of Soho. So you can see the lady at the top here with her big flowing dress showing you the district of Soho that we've been exploring tonight. And then lots and lots of people painted in the mural down below uh, in the panels as well. Uh, these are famous people who have lived in Soho or called at home at some part of their life. They didn't have to live here their entire lives or even that long. Uh, we'll focus on a few in the center here, just bring them up. So the gentleman in the yellow coat, talked about him in my first tour. I claimed him as a Pimlico one. Um, he first moved to London when he was four years old at the beginning of his professional career as a musician. I am, of course, referring to Mr. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. So that's the child prodigy in the yellow jacket. Just behind Mozart reading the book DK Das Kapital is uh, Karl Marx, called Soho Home. Uh, the gentleman in the right hand side here with the red coat on, Casanova. Yeah, real life Casanova, he uh, lived in Seoul as well. You can see I've taken the photograph here uh, last Wednesday at half past 11. If I was to stand there for another 29 minutes and watch the clock strike 12, then I would look up here to DK and see a tin of Coca-Cola uh, being produced from behind the book. Sort of a, a mocking of the anti-capitalist society uh, that Karl Marx uh, had wanted, you know, what he was aiming for, uh, his ideals and things like that. Not mocking him in any way, but just saying uh, capitalist uh, sort of won out in the end. 
Uh, we'll go over to the right of the mural then. And I'll focus on this gentleman, right? I'm about to tell you one of my favorite rock and roll stories, okay? Um, the gentleman in the bottom right-hand corner here in his bar is Mr. Ronnie Scott, okay? Very fam famous tenor saxophonist uh, from the 1940s. 1952, he set up his very own club here in London dedicated to blues musicians and jazz musicians. And he set it up in Soho uh, on Gerrard Street. So marked here. In fact, we'll go down into the Chinatown. There you go, beautiful with all the red lanterns and his club was down on the right hand side in the basement. Ronnie Scott used to work a lot on the uh, cruise ships uh, sailing backwards and forward from Southampton to New York City. So he's very familiar with 52nd Street in Manhattan Island and uh, loved their cellar uh, clubs and things like that. So set his one up in 52 here on Gerrard Street and then very quickly it became popular and he moved it. Uh, from Chinatown Gerrard Street up onto Frist Street uh, here. Uh, so we're Greek Street, remember, earlier on in Old Compton Street where the uh, uh, Coach and Horses pub. So we're just one street over. So Square, just up there. A Ronnie Scott's Club, a uh, very famous jazz location. Um, everybody's played here, you know. Uh, Aretha Franklin's played here. Joe Jones, both Joe Joneses, amazing drummers. Have you ever heard of Caravan? And uh, they both uh, performed that. Buddy Rich, a very famous American uh, drummer. If you've ever seen a movie called Whiplash, uh, that insane solo that he does at the end, based on Buddy Rich, Caravan, based on Joe Jones. And uh, Amy Winehouse performed here. Oh, um, man, I really like uh, Van Morrison. Uh, Van the Man from uh, Northern Ireland. He's performed here multiple times. And uh, this is Ronnie, Ronnie Scott. I'm a saxophone and the story that I like telling people uh, because I have a friend who lives down the street to the left um, on Frist Street and she used to be a waitress here at Ronnie Scott's. She was a waitress here in 2014. 2014, um, a very famous musician uh, decided to do a pop-up gig in uh, Soho. So the pop-up gigs, the way they're sort of designed is that they'll use their social media They'll just blast it out there. Hi, guys, if you're in the UK, I'll be coming there on, say, February 14th, you know, 2014. And uh, if you're in the area, keep an eye on social media. I'll give you more, you know, closer locations, uh, the closer we get to the date. Uh, so then, you know, it's going to be in London. So it gets closer to the date. He says, right, I'm going to be in Soho. And then on the morning, I'm going to be performing at Ronnie Scott. So if you queue up there, you can buy a ticket at the door. So lots of people flocked to Ronnie Scott. Some people reportedly uh, stood around for about 13 hours just to uh, get a glimpse of their hero, uh, this musical genius. And unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that well for the regular folk because, of course, leaks through management and so on. Celebrities have found out this guy was coming here as well. So they all started to rock up in their town cars. One after one, Adele and other famous faces just started going in through the doors. And no heed to the people standing in the queue. And it filled up the joint with celebrities. And Angela was saying she couldn't believe how many famous people were there. Uh, she was just doing her job and Prince went on stage. Uh, he performed for about an hour and a half, she said. Said it was an amazing set. And... Uh, yeah, I think I just revealed who it was, Prince. Uh, so it was Prince indeed. And uh, Angela said, Prince just, you know, rocked the first set, an hour and a half. And when he finished, all celebrities uh, went up and got their photo ops, you know, took a photo of Prince and so on, and then went ahead and left. Whereas um, Prince didn't leave. And Angela said, the floor manager was sort of just standing there going, is there anything else we can get for you, sir? You know, um, need any food or drink or... We need a car ready for you. Uh, what would you like? And Prince just turned around and said, look, is there anybody still hanging about outside? Uh, you know, because it's been an hour and a half since they shut the doors. So you had to be a pretty dedicated fan. And Prince fans are dedicated. So the manager was like, yeah, there's uh, quite a bit of a queue there. And Prince was like, right, <laughs> don't charge them in, I think. Just, you know, let them in. And uh, yeah, I I'll, I'll do a set for them. So uh, the manager goes outside and says, like, guys and girls, you know, you're ready. Prince wants to do a show for you guys. I'm sure the atmosphere must have been buzzing electric at that time. 
Uh, so they all go in, they take their seats, and Angela said Prince went on and did another two hours, two hours of music. And she said actually the second set, she could just see the difference in his eye, how happy he was because he was doing it for the fans that he wanted to do. I'm sure his first set was brilliant, and she said it was, but the second set was just something special. So yeah, that's a, a great little story uh, I like telling about Ronnie Scott. Uh, so if you're ever over in London, and you like jazz music? Yeah, it's a great little space. Once everything, uh, it'll be after May 17th, if we're sticking to our current roadmap situation, that we can eat indoors again. So players like Ronnie's will be able to open up and stuff like that. But yeah, good old Ronnie Scott's. Right, now where am I taking you to? Oh, we're going back to Carnaby Street. Okay, so we're looking at the mural here on the corner. So we've got Carnaby Street running the full length down here to Beak Street. And a parallel road to it then is here, which is Kingley uh, Street. And in between, wonderful Kingley Court. I'll, yeah, I'll show you a photograph of that. Uh, so this is Carnaby Street. <laughs> My luck with weather. You know, beautiful blue sky. You can still see a bit of sunshine, but this grey cloud came over it. But this is Carnaby Street. Very quiet, as you'd expect. Shops aren't able to open. Um, the Kingley Court is just into the left-hand side through a little archway here. So it's a food court I'll show you guys in a moment. Uh, Doc Martin to the left, and I'll show you a better photo there. So Doc Martin's is here. You see just above it, this shop here. So this is Ben Sherman. Uh, they've since moved. Uh, but Doc Martin's and Ben Sherman were uh, famous because when the Sex Pistols, these guys appeared, um, they said, if you want to dress like the Sex Pistols, all you have to do is head to Carnaby Street and go into two shops, Doc Martens and Ben Sherman, and that would be it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so much musical history, but <laughs> we don't have time for it. Uh, in the 1980s, then, uh, the punk movement got really into it. Uh, before that, you would have the mods and the rockers hanging out here in this area as well, getting off the mischief, having a few scraps and stuff, fighting between each other, and so on. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's Carnaby Street. Uh, pedestrianized completely, uh, so no delivery trucks or mopeds or anything like that. And it's basically a high street, you know, it's, it's just quiet. It's off the beaten path. So remember to check it out if you're visiting London uh, towards the end of this year into next year. This is Kingley Court, or Kingley Street rather, on the other side. Um, at the very end, you see this sort of Tudor looking building here, just uh, in between the purple lights. That is a big department store called Liberty, uh, built out of two old uh, warships, the Hindustan and the Impregnable. Uh, but yeah, but we're looking at King Lee Street here. In fact, we'll just pop into the co food court, which is now just to the right. So normal circumstances, this would be littered with benches, you know, and tables and lots of outdoor eatings. These are all restaurants the whole way around here and on the ground floor as well. There's, uh, up some up on the uh, second floor uh, so yeah it's wonderful and they should be able to operate a, a, a bit uh, from April 12th so I'll run up and check it was so quiet when I was here just a couple of people cleaning uh, the, uh, the, the the streets here as it were back on the Kingley Court Aha, another pub the Blue Posts remember marks out the uh, edge of the hunting grounds and this archway you'll see this all leading towards Carnaby Street and then we'll just pop down. Yes, nice little place. Uh, buddy of mine, uh, Gary, uh, and his mate Phil, we met here for an evening. It was great. Uh, it's more sort of New Orleans style blues, a uh, very intimate sort of stage, and the band already comes out and has a chat with you afterwards and stuff like that. It's, it's good fun if you're into blues music. All right, so the last street we'll look at this evening is Old Compton Street. So this one. This is really the heart of the uh, gay community um, in Soho, uh, Old Compton Street. Uh, you can see in the very center there, you see the big uh, G-A-Y uh, bar. And uh, yeah, so um, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s through the current day has uh, been the big gay scene in London. Uh, and it's also where I send guests, if they ever ask me for fish and chips, Old Compton Street, walk up Warroar Street, you pass a big church, turn right, and you're a poppy, so this big uh, fish and chip, very famous in London. Uh, lovely coffee shop, uh, just beside the Admiral Duncan uh, Bar. Uh, the guys here uh, roast the, the beans in the store and then grind them here as well. Uh, if you like coffee, 
this is heaven. And uh, like I said, uh, Avril Duncan here on the left hand side, and then another uh, big uh, sort of gay uh, bar club, uh, Compton's itself, just opposite the street. And then you've also got the theatres as well. Uh, so remember, we're right in the heart of the West End of London here. Uh, so you got Mary Poppins showing in the Prince Edward Theatre. Um, I think, again, May 17th, the theatres are allowed to open at half capacity, um, you know, or a thousand seats, if that's less than half capacity, they can have that. Uh, so Mary Poppins here, and at the very end of Old Compton Street, which would be on the right, Shaftesbury Avenue on the left, uh, we have the Palace Theatre then, uh, showing Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. So once again, I'm sure those guys are eager to get up and running, and uh, eager for everybody to get back to London and, and visit them. I know a few theatres have already put off shows until next year. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll hope for the best uh, and so on. So uh, that's the Soho tour, the first of this two-part um, tour from Rags to Riches. So next week, next Sunday, I'll be doing the... Uh, uh, so that's Sunday, the 4th of April. If you're watching this in the future, don't go back. Just look for the video. Uh, the 4th of April, Easter Sunday, uh, 2021. Uh, so I'll be on uh, to Riches on the Mayfair side. It's development, a bit more look at the Grosvenor family and so on. Uh, again, if you're watching this uh, currently, and uh, I know you guys that I'm sending this to, first of all, have paid the five pounds for the tickets and so on so we, we've got the total up the 325 in fact as of today uh we got up with your generous donation we got up to 435 um so yeah this is from last night's uh tour uh if you like the tour you like the videos always pop on to my facebook page uh the actual page uh best walking tours and leave a um a uh, little review is always nice just for other people uh, who don't know me or aren't aware of me and uh, just give them a bit of confidence that I sort of know what I'm doing, hopefully, <laughs> at some level. Uh, you can also join me on Instagram. I post up every now and again uh, little uh, photos of London, things that catch my eye, uh, give you a bit of the history just on the spot, as it were. So again, that's at Best Walking Tours. Uh, two weeks' time, um, uh, so whatever that's going to be, the 11th of April, I would imagine. Uh, I'm actually going to do something slightly different, and we'll head out of London, have a look at Canterbury, um, follow the works of Geoffrey Chaucer, the Canterbury Tales, and uh, discover uh, the real story behind the Canterbury Tales. Well, certainly behind the pilgrimage, anyway, to Canterbury. So, thanks very much for listening. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, and take care, guys. And it's always the part where I have to try to figure out how to get back. <laughs> Let's see. I'll just stop sharing. There we go.